Morning, everybody. Good morning. Sir, I haven't been called that in a long time. My name is Dr. Dan Eichenbaum, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to come am among fellow patriots and actually wear a sidearm. Um, we had a an open carry rally in, uh, where was that, Greensboro? Greensboro. Yeah. I made the mistake of actually taking my gun out of the holster, and they were very upset about it. I didn't point it at anyone, I just raised it in the air and said that this was my insurance policy against whatever the federal government wanted to do to take away my freedom and my rights. They took offense to that and I couldn't <laughs> understand that. I was only doing what Thomas Jefferson and George Washington would have clearly wanted to do. Oh, do I have to stand up? Sorry. I, today, um, I'm going to talk to you about a few things. Some really interesting points were raised in, in the first talk, and I think what I'm going to talk a little bit about is some of the, the why we need to do these things. That's, that's really kind of what I'm going to say. Dr. Dan's Freedom Forum uh, is my website, and we have uh, a lot of you know, important discussions there from time to time. Um, we put up blogs and posts. And please visit it. Sign up for our, our newsletter. Um, that's all I'd like you to do in that respect. But a couple weeks ago, when it was Constitution Week, I spoke in the public schools. I lectured to a number of high school classes, civics classes, in the 10th grade about the Constitution. Um, I was pretty fortunate and, and happy to find that a lot of the classes had been prepared. And they'd been prepared pretty well by some teachers who actually understood the Constitution and its place in history and why it was important. Um, basically, and I started out with one question. I said, students, I want you to think while I'm talking about one question. And that question is, who owns your body? Think about it. Really, that's why we're all here today. Every single one of us here believes that we own our own bodies. I know it for a fact that I own my own body, and I expect to act that way throughout the course of my life. And I would suspect that almost everyone here, if not everyone here, not only believes that, but also believes that yes, they will act in every way they possibly can to prove at all times that they own their own body. The federal government, and unfortunately the state government, and sometimes our local governments, don't believe that. And they want to act in a way to say, no, you don't own your own body. I own this piece, I own that piece, and I own the other piece. Well, that, my friends, is not freedom, as you well know. The motto of my website, and of my radio program as well, is the following statement. The right to own private property that cannot be arbitrarily confiscated by the government is the moral and constitutional basis for individual freedom. To me, that really says it all, because what we're talking about here is private property rights. Now, <clears throat> think back in history. King George and his tyranny ruled the colonies. Now, how did he do that? He ruled us in a way that had been the mode of operation in Europe for centuries. For centuries in Europe, you had a few people up at the top who owned absolutely everything and everybody else. Everybody else had very, very limited freedom. I call it the illusion of freedom is really all they had. Sure, yeah, they could get married, they had their little ox cart or their little business or whatever, but they didn't own anything of substance because the lord of the manor is the one who owned everything. And those little people paid heavy taxes to the lord of the manor for his protection. Well, that was the model that King George and his tyranny brought to our country. And as part of that, well, British soldiers could come to your house, knock on your door, write out a search warrant, break the door down, come in your house, throw you out, take whatever they wanted. If you spoke against King George in the public square, you could be arrested, dragged off, carted off somewhere. Who knows what would ever have happened to you. Well, when, after the Revolutionary War, when our, we won, obviously, the founders of this country said, 
We have a unique opportunity. This is not Europe. We don't have to go by any of those old mores under the old way of doing things that they've been doing for centuries in Europe. We can start something really new here so that everyone has true freedom. Not the illusion of freedom, but true freedom. And they did that by, by protecting property rights. Now, what did they mean by property rights? It's not just your land, your home, and your physical possessions. To our founders in this country, property rights were the work of your hands, the ideas of your brain, and your life itself. All of that consists your private property. There's a biblical basis for that, not just biblical, a moral basis. Our founders found this country on Judeo-Christian principles. So where do property rights come from? They come from the Ten Commandments, don't they? Thou shalt not steal. Well, that's pretty obvious. How about thou shalt not covet? Because if you covet something, you're only about this far away from stealing it, aren't you? How about thou shalt not bear false witness? Well, if you bear false witness in a court of law against someone, you can take away their property, you can take away their freedom, and you certainly can, in some instance, take away their life. And obviously, thou shalt not kill the major thing, because if you own your own body and if you're truly free, you are the one who has the choice about what happens to it. So our founders said, they looked upon this country and they said, we have the opportunity to make people truly free. They were smart though, weren't they? They said the coin of freedom, individual freedom is on one side, the other side of that coin is personal responsibility. So without individual freedom on one side and without personal responsibility, those are the two sides of the coin of freedom and that's what you have to have to have a free society. So they based all this on what they called natural law rights. Now, we all know what natural law rights are. I'm probably preaching to the choir, as you, as you well know. But natural law rights are the rights that you have because you are born. They come to you by dint of your humanity and cannot be taken away. That's what a natural law right is. That's what Thomas Jefferson meant by life, liberty, and property. That's what in the Declaration of, Pre of, of Independence is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, what's the difference between natural law rights and rights that government give you? Obviously, a whole bunch. Because rights that are given to you by the government encumber you with, or some other person, with a debt. And that's the point. Natural law rights put no obligation on any other person. I have the right to pursue happiness but I do not have the right to force any of you to provide happiness for me. That's the difference. So if someone says to you, I have the right to food, your first question should be, well, who's going to pay for it? When I talked to the, to the students, the 10th grade students about this, I said to them, do you think you have the right to eat? Well, what 10th grader doesn't think he has the right to eat? So I told them, I said, here's what you do. You go down to Ingalls. I want you to fill your shopping cart full of food. Come up to the cashier and say, I don't have to pay for this because I got the right to eat. And that's what made them understand that, yeah, you, you don't have the right to eat. We're going to be talking about things like tomorrow, and obviously Obamacare is a, a very big subject. You do not have the right to receive medical care. Sure, everyone should have medical care, and it would be nice if everyone could have medical care, but you don't have the right to receive it because if you say, once you say, you have the right to receive medical care, that means you are obligating someone else to provide the medical care for you. In this case, the government is coming to me as a physician, putting a gun to my head and saying, you're going to take care of these people for whatever I say, you're going to take care of them for. That it pushes obligation on me to provide a government-issued right to someone else. And that's the difference between natural law rights and government-issued rights. They can't take natural law rights away from you. The government, however, when it issues you a right, it's issuing that right for a purpose. 
And that purpose is to buy votes and to remain in power. We all know that the one purpose of government which has become for us today what we're witnessing is a government not of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government that is intent on increasing its power over every single one of us in order to control us and to tell us what to do. The previous speaker talked to you about Agenda 21. I've been traveling all over talking about Agenda 21 because what is that? It's theft of property rights. That's what Agenda 21 is all about. It's about stealing your right to own, enjoy, live on, and use your property as you see fit. You know, one of the things we run into with that is that once you say the UN is doing this, people turn it off immediately. They, don't, they can't understand what the United Nations in New York City has to do with our right to live free here in North Carolina. The fact is, is they're smart these people in New York. They're smart, these people at the UN. And they have hidden their true agenda in an alphabet soup of agencies at every level of local government. When I started crusading against Agenda 21 and started investigating it, I was immediately swamped by agency after commission after group when you name whatever names, they all sound wonderful. They're going to cure cancer and bring peace on earth. They all are. But what they are really doing is stealing our property rights, our natural law right to own property, our natural law right to protect ourselves. Self-protection, an obvious natural right. So this is what we're dealing with in this country today. And it has come over the last hundred years while we were all sleeping. Most of us here, another thing that was mentioned was communism, wasn't it? Most of us here remember the Cold War. We lived through, I certainly lived through the Cold War. And so we knew that we were fighting a foe, the communist foe. We were taught about it in schools, the teachers taught about it, your parents taught about it, it was all over the news. There was an evil group of people over there. They were bad. We were good. Okay? When that wall came down, when the Soviet Union broke up, that battle kind of faded from everyone's minds, didn't it? Well, that was on purpose. Those of you who have, don't know who Curtis Bowers is should see his film called Agenda, Grinding America Down, if you haven't already. It's about exactly that subject. Grinding America down? Grinding America down. I'm going to tell you just briefly what it's all about. In 1958, Skousen wrote a book called The Naked Communist. It was very widely read back then, 1958, and then it was forgotten. Well, in 1992, Curtis Bowers was just graduating as a graduate student from the University of California, and a friend of his in Idaho, where he's from, called him up and said, Curtis, the Communist Party USA is having a major meeting in Berkeley and all of the fellow travel groups are going to come and meet in Berkeley. I want you to go and I want you to find out what's going on. Infiltrate the meeting. So Curtis Bowers thought he would infiltrate this meeting. He dressed up like he thought he should in order to infiltrate this meeting. He he had long hair, and he put an earring in his ear, and he wore jeans with holes in them and t-shirts, and he walked into this meeting. And who was in this meeting? A bunch of middle-aged people in suits and ties with briefcases. And they outlined at that point the 45-point plan for taking over this country from the inside. And that's exactly what they have been doing in earnest since 1992. What were their plans? Their plans were those 45 goals spelled out in 1958. If you want to read an interesting book, Curtis Bauer's father, Stephen Bowers, wrote a book called The Naked Truth last or two years ago in which he took those 45 goals and he said, here is what they have achieved. And the sad fact is they have achieved 44 out of those 45 goals 100% in 20 years. What they wanted to do 
was they first of all wanted to destroy the American family. Because they recognize American families are what keeps America free, prosperous, and moral. So they wanted to destroy the American family, and they did that with the feminist movement, which was all part of the movement to make women feel that they weren't worth anything if they didn't work outside the home. Easy divorce. They wanted to destroy the morality of America. And they did that by getting the gay and lesbian agenda to be accepted as commonplace. And the other thing they wanted to do was to destroy American industry and American productivity. And they did that with the environmental movement. That same environmental movement that is part and parcel of Agenda 21 and all of these local NGOs that are busy destroying our productivity in this country. Yes? The Skousen book, what was the title? Uh, yes. the, the first one was called The Naked Communist. It was written in 58. Okay. But much more instructive than that is to read Curtis Bauer's father's book called The Naked Truth. which that came Stephen Bowers? Stephen Bowers. That is correct. Get his DVD. But and Grinding America Down. Right now. Agenda, Agenda Grinding America Down. Got it. Thank you. It's important to understand what they're doing. And what they're doing is attacking private property rights. Because the very first part of the Communist Manifesto is no private property. Karl Marx was asked, in order for communism to succeed in a worldwide basis, what is the one thing that has to happen? His answer was simple. There can be absolutely no ownership of private property. So he understood that that is the source of our freedom, the ability to own private property that cannot be arbitrarily confiscated by the government. How does the government take our property? Eminent domain, forced annexation. That's the way they take your property from you. But there are ways they can take your property where you still own it. And that's by regulation. I call that theft by regulation. And that's what Agenda 21 is all about. Sure, you can own your property, but they won't let you build your house where you want to. They won't let you take your rainwater. They won't let you put your car where you want to put it. We are, suffer we are fighting now in Cherokee County the, the Region A toolbox, which is all part of the Southwestern Commission, which is just one of those NGOs that is giving regulations to our county commissions about where we should put our houses. They have what are called view shed regulations. View shed regulations means that if some people that you do not even know are driving by on the highway, they should be able to look up in your mountain and not see your roof. So they come up and they say, you, you want to put your house where you want to put it so you get a nice view. They come up and say, well, you can't because your roof line would break the line of the mountain right here. You have to put your house over there. That is theft of your property rights because you can't use the property that you own. They come in and they take your streams and they demand a 50-foot setback on each side of your stream. We had a farmer in Macon County with a 64-acre farm. They wanted to put 50-foot setbacks on all of, his, all of his springs and his creeks. He calculated that if that went through, out of those 64 acres, he'd had seven usable acres of land. That is theft by regulation, part and parcel of Agenda 21. If you don't want to talk about the UN, a very evil, evil organization, and its origins, by the way, go back 100 years to Woodrow Wilson, in case you don't know that. Woodrow Wilson and his cronies, his one world cronies, they wanted to start the League of Nations. Fortunately, that failed. But they didn't go away. They didn't go away at all. And that's the lesson from all of this, is these people don't go away. They try it once, you beat them back, they be quiet for a year, they come right back. So when the League of Nations didn't pass, they formed the Council, the Council for Foreign Relations which was the exact same thing in this country that worked for a one world order. It's in their charter. It's in everything they do. And when they had the opportunity, what did they do? They forced the United Nations on us after World War II. 
These same people who have been there for a hundred years, and they're, they're people that they train, forcing a one world order, one world government, one world currency, now with the U UN being the primary motivating force. And what is it all about? It's all about property rights. The right to own private property that cannot be arbitrarily confiscated by the state. And how they do it? They do it by treachery, by trickery, by lying, by cheating, and by stealing your rights while you're asleep. NGOs, how does it work? Regional government. You hear about regionalism. That's the way it's done. Forget the UN. It's happening when your county and the county next to you and the county next to you, they get together and they say, we need a commission to study land use in the three counties. Or we need a commission to study transportation in the three counties. And so they appoint people into this commission. Okay? The commission then makes rules, regulations, laws, taxation, whatever, that comes back down to the counties that rubber stamp it. So you voted for your county commission. But you don't vote for the people on that regional commission. They make the rules, they make the laws that you have to live by. You can't go get rid of them. Of course you can, but it's not legal. And that's the point. There is no legal means for us to do away with people who are making rules and regulations that affect our lives. It's what's called a Taxation without representation, that's what the entire Revolutionary War was fought about. And yet, so here we are 230 years later, and we have squandered the gift of freedom that we were given by our founders. We were squandered that gift because we allowed people with greed and a lust for power to take control of our lives and take control of our government can't stand. And that's why we're all here today. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. With, uh, as far as the philosophy behind a one world government, did you, uh, have you seen Cleon Skousen's book, The Naked Capitalist? Ah, uh, yes, I've heard about that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of wonderful reading on this subject. Uh, I think, I think when it comes to the UN, you have to understand it, and Nathan Tabor wrote a wonderful book about the UN, you call it the, the Beast on the East River. He's a local fellow from Greensboro area. Um, I would suggest reading his book. Uh, he goes through the UN Charter section by section in which he points out all of the one world government. They want, they want, they want us to be totally disarmed because they want the only army in the world to be the UN Army. The UN peacekeeping force. I saw a great documentary put out by the John Birch Society. Uh, we showed it at our grassroots, our 912 meeting two weeks ago. It's called the UN Deception. I would I would get that uh, video and watch that as well. The UN Deception goes through the history of the UN, and if once you see that, you understand that they have fostered, they have protected, and advanced the careers of dictators, murderers. Uh, the, the worst people on earth, you look at what they did in Africa, uh, they supported Mao over Chiang Kai-shek, millions and millions of people, hundreds of millions of people have been murdered based on UN edicts, UN protection, totalitarian government, socialism, socialism and communism is the most effective and efficient killing machine that has ever ever been invented on earth. Yes, sir. I was, not a comment, I was just, or a question. I, I was just going to take a little bit of issue when you mentioned that one of the commandments was thou shalt not kill. I believe the original, as best anybody can tell, the original interpretation is thou shalt not shed innocent blood. There's a big difference right. for me as a Christian to understand that God said you shall not shed innocent blood. I agree with you 100%, and as a Christian as well, I also understand that God does not want us to die 
personally, we need, he wants us to be alive to protect ourselves and our family. Yeah. And if killing someone else who was a threat to you is necessary, that is perfectly well, like my daughter here today. My job is to make sure that she's safe. Absolutely no argument. No argument whatsoever. Yes. Just an amen to your general um, commentary about Agenda 21 and how far along it is. When you see the word sustainability <laughs> coming out of the mouths of anybody, that is absolutely the marker. Yeah. And I can tell you from the bowels of big time corporate America, these people in big time corporate America are down with that program. They have multi score million dollar budgets for the sustainability programs that nobody can define. And I'm talking insiders within the company. Well, um, tell me in English what that means. Hamada, 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 hamada. It's as bad as you say, plus that global corporatist element. Well, you know, first of all, the word sustainability was not developed for the United Nations of Agenda 21. It was developed for that, for actually on a corporate level, sustainability, the ability right. to sustain is where it comes. It was a fabricated word. Right. But I'll tell you another thing. The UN, these people are so evil and so smart that they understand now that we know what sustainability is and sustainable development. They're not even using that anymore. They're morphing. They're morphing to use smart growth. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the word smart meters come from? Yeah, all of that stuff, the, all of that stuff is their understanding that we are on to them. It, it's, it's all under the guise of good intentions. And I'm sure that there are actually people there with good intentions, but then the ultimate consequences from, from this is... is well, what, what had happened, what, what you saw was how this whole thing came about. It's really fascinating when you look at the history. You take one channel, which was the, the League of Nations, the UN, the, all of those one world people, okay? They're the big people with tons of money and whatever. They wanted one world government, okay? In the 50s, the environmental mo movement was pretty innocent. Right. Don't drive down the highway and throw trash out of the car. Yeah, we want to have clean air and we want to have clean water. Well, who was going to argue with that? No one. But in amongst those environmentalists were these environmental ext extremists who understood that since they were socialists, that they could use the environmental movement to cripple our economy. And that's when those two movements came together. And they came together and they married perfectly in 1992 at the Conference of Rio. And so the United Nations is using, has co-opted the, the environmental movement for their socialist aims. And that's when the two came together and have marched forward ever, ever since. Your point is well taken. We here are subject to the Appalachian Development Commission. Sounds terrific. Who is who's afraid of having development? Good development. But there is a socialist group who wants to limit our land use, move us off our land into small human cities where we live in uh, little cubicles. You look at any of those futuristic science fiction movies like Judge Dredd or whatever, that's their vision of how we are supposed to be living in the future. Not out here in the middle of a beautiful farmland. All of this has got to go back to nature. Okay? They want us to live in basically human prison camps. Yes, sir? Just uh, want to speak to the fact that how pervasive this is that the UN and the other globalists couldn't implement this top down, so they had to use the NGOs and have planning, the central planning committees, so it's camouflage. But in our state, Pat McCrory is running now. And it's, you'd be hard pressed to find someone more committed to Agenda 21. When he was in Charlotte, he implemented light rail. This is to push the subcompact cities. They're pushing it now. They're trying desperately in Wake County to get light rail in. And said, you know, the choice we have in the fall. Pat McCrory is wholly given to this. Yeah, he he was. Um, Neil Thomas held his feet to the fire in an interval that appeared in the Gas Bay Gazette about a year or so ago, in which. He, Pat McCrory just fumbled around for an hour trying to avoid being labeled as pro Agenda 21. But you're right, he, he did all that stuff when he mayor's was mayor of Charlotte. Mayor's Council. <laughs> all the mayor's councils, the, the four stand Mega regions. Mega regions. <laughs> land of Sky, you know, Council of Governments. It sounds wonderful. The problem is it has only one purpose 
and that's to steal our land for us, theft by regulation, actual theft. Uh, I mean, a really incredible book just came out, and I forgot who wrote it, but it's about, uh, about regionalism uh, itself, and it's about how uh, Obama's policies are designed to steal money from the suburbs to fund the cities to destroy the suburbs. The American way of life has been to move out of the cities and live in the suburbs. What, did, what person in the city didn't want to say, someday I'm going to move out to the suburbs, have a house with land, and my family go to good schools? Well, their purpose, what they're trying to do now is to equalize taxation so that the taxes you pay in the suburbs are used to fund inner city projects, thereby stealing the funds from you, which will decrease the quality of your schools and your quality of life. Atlanta's on the forefront of that. They're oh, yeah. they've Absolutely. Working, they've been working to, I, I think the ruse is that they want to annex the outlying counties, but they're not going to expand services. Right. So they, they, they want the money, but they're not going to. And you know what, they, the other thing they do is this mixed-use housing type yeah, thing. Yeah. Because what they want to do is they want to move inner-city people out into the suburbs that dilutes your political power in the suburbs. Well, that's what mass transit's about. And too, that's too. what mass transit is about. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And the problem is that when you're looking at what do you do about this, once you start looking at it, it is right. so pervasive. It is so everywhere. It is like the hydra. You know, you cut off a head, there's another head over here. And you know, the only way, the absolute only way that we are going to be able to end this threat is to get to the root of the problem, the United Nations. The UN has got to go. Period. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody.